Welcome back. I'm continuing on the uh, Kabbalah decode of the ninth gate. Mumbo jumbo ritual or walking the walk. Judging from ongoing comments to the boards for this film at the Internet Movie Database website, there seem to be two different opinions about exactly what was necessary in order to pass through the nine gates. Some, like Balkan, believe that all of that that all that was required was to possess the original nine engravings initialed by LCO, to place them in a particular order and recite some words. I believe that to look at it in this way is to confuse the map with the territory and to risk falling into the category of mumbo jumbo. The engravings describe two possible paths which must be followed in real life. Each path leading to radically different experiences and end points. There are scenes in the movie which physically mimic the symbolism of the engravings, like the scene of Bernie the bookseller's body hanging in the pose of the tarot's hanged man, as shown in the engraving for the sixth gate, and the resemblances between some of the characters in the engravings and real people Corso encounters on his journey. I believe this, these were included to give viewers the clue that the journey depicted in the engravings was also happening in the lives of the movie's main characters, but since the journey up the tree is one of internal spiritual evolution in Corso's case, or the lack of it in Balkans, depicting it outwardly would be difficult to impossible except through the use of such periodic symbolic clues. Not every engraving is illustrated in this literal visual way. For some, symbolic rituals performed as part of a spiritual path may help to focus the mind, but they are certainly not required. The engravings may be valuable in their function as maps, but you still have to make the journey. In the movie, Corso is the one who successfully completes the journey because he enters into partnership with the girl, who helps him to follow the path which is symbolized by the LCF variations of the engravings. Balkan, the so-called black magician, refuses to make the journey beyond ego dominance and tries to use the energies of the tree to serve the desires and power drives of his own ego. Vulcan's path is symbolized by the AT variations of the engravings, and it ends in exactly the kind of fiery destruction which the collective ego consciousness of our time is now trying to convince us is also our fate, Armageddon, the end of the world. I just want to point out that Armageddon is a misunderstood word also. The original, uh, the Hebrew word for Armageddon here, there's a root, um, the word is rooted in the Hebrew term Har Moed, which means Mount of the Congregation or Mount of the Assembly. Um, then this person continues, do you see where this leads us, that the same term Har Moed was used by Satan when he said, I will sit upon the Mount of the Congregation. And of course, I don't believe in Satan um, in that way. It's just... Um, Nimrod going up the mountain type idea or any person that would go up to the mountain and say that you can be um, from God and as I talked about earlier is the mountain actually more spiritual when Moses went up the mountain to speak to Yahweh face to face is that what this is referring to that there's somebody out there that doesn't just want to speak to Yahweh face to face they want to be Yahweh so they want to go up that mountain and be Yahweh, and that might be um, the symbolism there. And there's going to be a battle at that mountain, um, at the Mount of the Congregation. That's the Battle of Arm Moed. Moed. Um, so um, just want to point out that Armageddon doesn't necessarily mean what they're telling us it means. And of course, the apocalypse just means the uncovering of information, the revealing of things. That's why it's called revelation, because we're getting some revelations about things. Um, there's a revealing going on. And so I have an article on the website about that too, but you know, we're, we're bombarded with the idea that Armageddon and apocalypse are just horrible things. Whereas, you know, if we are on the mountain with uh, Yehoshua at the end, um, speaking with Yahweh face to face, because things are being revealed to the body of Christ, then that's nothing to fear. And it's the uncovering, the apocalypse um, is the uncovering of everything. So we're being given knowledge if we choose to accept it. And uh, 
So yeah, uh, they're they're definitely trying to convince people that it's going to be awful and everything, but um, it's not. But continuing on here, but as the LCF engraving of the fourth gate illustrates, fate is not the same for all. And for those who devote themselves to the real life journey up the tree described by the LCF version of the engravings, the ultimate fruit of the quest is nothing less than personal transformation and the experience of the world from the perspective of the higher self, as depicted in the genuine ninth gates symbol of the New Jerusalem, emphasis added. I also want to point out um, that we've got the LCF supposedly guiding somebody to the truth, the light, they're getting illuminated, and you've got the other version that leads to fire and damnation. And they're giving you these two options and saying one's bad, one's good. That's the red versus the blue. They want you to pick a side, you know, the dark side or the light side, right, with Star Wars. But there's another option that we don't need those two. And the other option is following our father. Continuing on, LCF versus the devil, a case of mistaken identity. The movie's characters all seem to agree that the purpose of the combined content of all the LCF engravings is to raise the devil. Most of them, with the exception of Corso, take this to mean that the engravings are to be used to construct a ritual at the end of which a supernatural entity representing the force of evil in the world will appear. Poof and grant the one performing the ritual special, special powers. The main problem with this is that the symbolism of the engravings doesn't support that idea at all, but instead suggests an entirely different interpretation of the phrase, to raise the devil. The symbolism used actually impressed me very much. I believe that either the illustrator was a serious student or initiate of a mystery tradition himself, or he must have worked in close collaboration with someone who was. The way in which director Roman Polanski and his fellow screenwriters integrated the meaning of the engravings into, the vision, into his vision of the plot of the movie is also impressive and is the subject of section 8 of this article, The Polanski Code. The most interesting twist with the engravings is that it is the variations bearing the initials LCF which actually represent stages in the development of the very positive internal spiritual state which leads to the experience depicted in the genuine LCF engravings of the Ninth Gate, then encounter with the encounter with light. This confirms to me that despite what any of the movie characters might believe, LCF stands for Lucifer the Light Bearer, a symbolic figure representing a non-dual spiritual evolutionary force which is separate and distinct in its nature and function from our current popular conception of the degenerate symbolic figure of evil, the devil or Satan. The journey beyond evil. All climbers welcome. In Torchia's AT version of the engraving, small symbolic variations describe a path which has only one final destination, an ultimate dissolution, destruction of the same nature as the destruction of the body by fire which Torchia or Torchia himself suffered. If you take the time to explore the symbolism of the engravings, I believe it will be clear that although Balkan possessed Almost all of the necessary LCF symbols, his pre-existing mindset made it impossible for him to gain a true understanding of the meaning of the symbolism, and so he made no effort to align himself spiritually with the variations depicted in the LCF engravings. His internal state, in fact, corresponded exactly to the symbolism of the Torquia version, so that even if he had possessed the genuine ninth engraving, his unevolved internal spiritual state would still have condemned him to suffer the same destructive result. Once again, I want to point out the symbolism here. The writer is saying that Torquia had everything, all the books, everything, right? And you can talk about the mainstream Christian having the Bible, all the books in the Bible, maybe even some extra books, but they follow the Bible with their preconceived notions and that leads them to believe that they can stay in sin in which case they will end up in the fire the lake of fire so and of course I'm talking symbolically here you can see my video on Lazarus and the rich man for more information on that so um, 
they are just at a loss, basically, um, to truth because they have a preconception that says they already know truth. They don't need anything else. As I mentioned, Revelation talks about those who are lukewarm. They think that they're already clothed. They think they have enough money. They think they are rich when they're poor and naked. And that's what's going on here. It's talking about how um, he possessed everything that he thought he needed to gain entrance into the kingdom. Of course, it's the kingdom of Satan. But regardless, he thought he had everything he needed to get into the kingdom. But he was thinking carnally and he wasn't thinking spiritually. So that's, um, you know, there's some important things to understand that's being said here. And you can see that in the scriptures. So I'll continue on uh, with this writer here. The lesson is that in the determination of fate, it is the nature of the internal spiritual state, which is the deciding factor. And the nature of your own internal spiritual state is entirely up to you and the life choices, life choices which you make. To follow Corso's successful path, at some point it is necessary to forge an alliance with your own best understanding of a higher power, a benevolent spiritual guiding force which can help inspire and challenge you to grow beyond ego consciousness and align yourself with the greater purpose, power, and harmony of your own soul. This is the real life equivalent of the guiding and protective function which the girl provides to Corso in the film. For an analysis of her enigmatic nature and ultimate identity, see my response to the first reader's comment in the commentary section of this article. I also want to point out that if um, if the girl is marking him, that, that she's the horror Babylon that rides the beast, and I think that they are um, connected. So I think it's kind of the body of Christ whereas the beast is the antichrist. The beast has spots. The spots are, you know, spots and blemishes and the Bible is sin. So the body of Christ has spots and blemishes. They have sin. So I believe the, the beast is the body of Christ and the whore that rides it is uh, the mother of that body. And, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is always talking about how it's the mother of all the religions there, the, the Christian religions. So I believe that um, the whore is the Roman Catholic Church or the Roman Church, but could just consider it the Antichrist Church. And, um, and then on the other side, you've got the body of Christ with the true uh, church. And I'm not sure exactly who the woman would represent. Oh, um, the woman, the whore could represent the Antichrist spirit also because the Roman Catholic Church is full of the Antichrist spirit and that the popes and everything say that they are God on earth basically and um, geez, they're in the place of Jesus and that is the literal term Antichrist means to come in the place of and they say they are the vicar of Christ coming in the place of him. So that Antichrist spirit could be the female there and the female on the other side could represent the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is combined with the body of Christ, whereas on the other side, the Antichrist spirit is combined with the uh, body of the Antichrist. And they are one in purpose and unity. Um, so that's probably where the girl comes into, into play. And in the um, in the uh, the movie, the girl is on top of the man, and so that is the showing of. Um, I mentioned the the head of Christ is God, and uh, Christ is above uh, man, uh, Adam, and Eve is inside of Adam. So Adam is the head of Eve, and you know in the same way. Uh, Christ is the head of Adam and God is the head of Christ. So the woman is supposed to be under the man or inside the man, the completion there. And in that way, the Antichrist spirit flips that so that the woman is on top. 
So that's what the representation is here, I think, of this movie at the end scene. Um, it's the horror Babylon being on top. She rides the beast rather than um, being uh, driven by the Holy Spirit, perhaps. Continuing on, every religious tradition has its own language to describe the same process of spiritual evolution in different ways. And those who have completed the journey, no matter what tradition they followed, have been unanimous in recognizing that all paths up the mountain lead to the same peak. This is easy to see when you're looking down, but much less obvious from the ego's perspective at the very base of the mountain. The path of return of the tree of life is one traditional way up this same symbolic mountain. The major problems come in the earliest stage of the journey in the case of those who don't progress beyond the perspective of ego and expend their energies not in completing their own journey, but in declaring that those who are following all of the other paths up the mountain are evil, making war on them and trying to stamp them out. From the perspective of ego consciousness, the symbolic figure of the devil is identified with anyone who doesn't believe exactly what I believe, and for this reason, it is in the realm of ego consciousness, the realm of the lower mind at the base of the mountain, where the concept of the devil finds its ultimate playground. This is why the teachings of Jesus the Christ, for example, require disciples, first and foremost, to love one another, to love their neighbors as themselves, to judge not lest they be judged, to love and forgive even their enemies, and to remove first the beam in their own eye before presuming to remove the speck in their brother's eye. At the top of the mountain, in the realm of spirit soul, the divisive concept of the devil has no power. The realm of the domination of the ego mind is finally left behind in the passage through the sixth gate. And as we will see in the analysis of the ninth gate, it is this very lower ego mind which the apocalypse of St. John rightly identifies with the destructive nature of the beast and the number 666. Where is that 100th monkey? The analysis of the symbolism contained in the engravings and in the plot of the movie is not a simple subject, and I originally took on this challenge because of my own fairly obsessive curiosity and for my own use. But since it seems clear to me that the world as most of us know it is currently at risk of being destroyed by the raging desires and fears of a collective ego consciousness which is long overdue to be brought into balance under the guidance of the wisdom consciousness of the soul or spirit, and since this essential transition can only happen if each one of us makes his her own journey individually, I thought it would be worth the effort to try to describe in the simplest possible way what the journey represented by the symbols in the engravings is all about, for those who are not f familiar with it. As some of you reading this will know, there are a great many people in the world who have already quietly and unobtrusively com completed the journey which the engravings symbolically describe and their numbers will only increase with time. No membership in any secret organization is required, only the desire for a better life and a better world, and the will to achieve both by working on yourself to become a better person. I'm going to actually talk about a spiritual awakening in some videos later in the series, and so that's what this is discussing, but not calling it by that term, spiritual awakening. So I just wanted to point that out in the future when I do mention it. This is what they're referring to. Once this work is begun in earnest, the spiritual development which follows is an entirely natural and spontaneous evolutionary process. And the more people who make the trip, the easier it becomes for others to follow. You may have heard of the famous case of the group of monkeys on one island who learned that washing their sweet potatoes in the ocean made them taste better. Soon all the monkeys on the island copied their example and started washing their potatoes, and at a certain point, called the tipping point, enough monkeys had adopted this behavior that monkeys on another island, who had no contact with the original monkeys, suddenly started washing their potatoes too. The lesson is that there is a level at which consciousness is collective, and when that 100th monkey, as this syndrome is called, makes the transition to a new standard of behavior, everybody else evolves right along with him. Uh, I'm going to point out that I've researched the 100th monkey a little bit a while back ago and I couldn't find anything legitimate on it as far as, you know, it actually being real. I don't know. I'm not saying that the um, 
that this collective consciousness is not real. I believe that it is, basically. I believe that's part of why they're planting subconscious uh, predictive programming in TV and movies, because I think they're getting the collective consciousness, they're, they're putting that in their psyche or whatever, and um, that people are sort of bringing it about. In Genesis, um, I think it's 11.6, it talks about how uh, the Tower of Babel, it said that with everybody speaking of one accord and, you know, becoming one together, that there was nothing that they could not do. Anything that they imagined to do would be done. And that's a reference to this. Um, with enough people imagining it, um, they can make it happen. And we're going to be seeing that, I think, um, soon with enough people coming together because things are already happening. Um, I mean, the, the jihad is being put together and they're gathering more people and, um, you know, it just seems like things are really happening. More people and more people are waking up this past couple of years and it goes back further than a couple of years, but, you know, that's just the flatter stuff was the last couple of years and it's just gotten more and more people. Anyway, um, continuing on here, as a perennial optimist, I'd like to dedicate this article to that potential 100th monkey who may be reading this sentence right now. In the following section two, deciphering the engravings, we will look briefly at the meaning of the symbol of the serpent on the tree and at the significance of the Hebrew and Greek letters which appear at the top of each engraving. Um, this is just notes. All right, deciphering the engravings. just the top part, okay. The frontispiece engraving, the serpent on the tree. The fictitious book in the film is called The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows, and it would probably be helpful to know right from the start that the journey depicted in the engravings begins in the Kingdom of Shadows, which is how many people now perceive this world. And the nine gates are passed through on the journey out of the Kingdom of Shadows. Most of the owners and pursuers of the book never understand this, and in fact believe exactly the opposite. And it is this mindset which is at least partly responsible for drawing to them their various gruesome fates. The frontispiece engraving of the book shows a tree being struck by lightning, which causes a portion of the tree to fall, while a snake with its tail in its mouth winds itself around the base of the tree. Those who are familiar with the basic teachings of the Kabbalah will recognize this as a reference to the Kabbalistic diagram called the Tree of Life. The diagram of the tree is made up of ten circular centers referred to as a sephiro, uh, singular, or sephiro, plural. These are connected by 22 paths, each path corresponding to one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and one of the 22 trumps of the tarot's major arcana. Each sephira on the tree is related to a state of human consciousness, and the film's nine gates correspond to specific points of transition which the individual traveler encounters on his journey of evolving consciousness up the tree. He will climb from a state of minimal ego awareness at the very bottom of the tree and ultimately reach the realm of spirit and the vision of light at the very top of the tree, which is the opening of the ninth gate. A thorough study of this diagram and navigation of the experienced realities which the symbols of the tree of life represent might be the work of many lifetimes, but it is possible to touch the high points which are represented in the engravings of the nine gates and get a general idea of the territory and the journey. To help in visualizing the paths which the traveler of the engravings takes as he climbs the tree of life, a more or less traditional diagram of the tree with the names of the ten sephiro and the names of the Hebrew letters which are assigned to the paths can be viewed at this link. I'll leave a link below to the other thing too, so you can see there. Editor's note, it might be worthwhile to print out this description of the tree of life for use in reading this essay. Also, as you read the interpretations of each of the nine gates, you might be mentally pronouncing the names of the ten sephiro many times, and if you would like to pronounce them correctly, Appendix P provides a pronunciation guide. 
There's a long tradition in tarot of correlating individual cards with the meaning of Hebrew and Greek letters, each letter having a corresponding numerical value. And the descriptions for each gate, rather than reproducing the Hebrew and Greek letters, which appear at the top of each engraving, have spelled out the names of the letters instead. It's important to note that while the 22 Hebrew letters are assigned to the paths between the sephiro on the tree, the Hebrew letters that appear at the top of the engravings do not refer to the paths. The symbols shown are simply the first nine letters of each alphabet in sequence, except for the Greek, where a substitution has been made in the letter representing the number six. According to the Cornell University Epigraphy Project, in order to construct a complete numerical system for the Greek letters, 27 letters were required, 9 letters for the single units, 1 through 9, 9 letters for the teens, and 9 for the hundreds. Because there were only 24 letters in the Greek alphabet at the time, three obsolete letters were reinstated, including a letter variously called digamma or stigma to represent the number 6. The form of this letter, which we will call stigma, begins with a variant lowercase form of sigma with a snake-like X S shape, which is used only at the end of a word. The variant form of sigma was modified by adding an extended horizontal rather than curved cap, which is taken from the top of the letter towel. So the letter representing six, called stigma, is a composite of the variant form of sigma, bottom, and form of tau, top. The regular non-variant lower case form of sigma, roughly circular with colic, has the value of 200. The Greek letter which appears on the engraving for the sixth gate is the snake-like lower case form of sigma, which is used only at the end of a word, with its curved top unmodified. Although there is a table at Wikipedia which shows the symbol as representing six, it appears this is a misidentification based on a confusion between the similar forms of sigma and stigma. I have found no other reference which identifies the unmodified variant form of sigma with any official numerical value. If this letter form of sigma has no official numerical value, the only number associated with it would be 18, since it is the 18th letter of the existing Greek alphabet. In terms of numerology, the number 18 can be represented as 1 plus 8 equals 9, or more provocatively, 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 18. This is not the technical equivalent of the number of the beast, which in Gematria is 666, but I think it can legitimately be seen as a reference to it. We will have more to say about this when we come to the analysis of the symbolism of the ninth gate. There we will. There we may discover not only why Greek letters were prominently featured on the engravings, but also why attention may have been deliberately been called to the particular variation of the Greek letter sequence which appears on the engraving for the sixth gate showing the symbol of the hangman. With these preliminaries, preliminaries established, we now begin the symbolic journey of the path of return, or the path of the serpent, from the lowest point on the tree of life, in the realm of ego, to the highest point in the realm of spirit, a journey which begins with the opening of the first gate. So I'm going to end this video and continue on in the next one. Thanks for listening. Shalom.